Okay, well, good morning, Calvary Chapel Temecula. It's good to see you for this Sunday morning service. If you're joining us online, we want to welcome you as well to the morning service. So we've got a busy day today. Hopefully you're able to join us for the different things that we got going on. So we have our service. We have communion today. It's the third Sunday of the month. We are going to have a guest speaker after the service as well, and then we have our softball game. So let me give you some of those details, okay? So um, immediately after service, uh, have you guys heard of Dr. Joe Komrowski? He's the Temecula School Board, current Temecula School Board president. No? Okay. So anyway, just to give you guys kind of a little bit of backstory, um, the, how should I say it? The liberal side of the uh, electorate is trying to remove him because he's a conservative and standing for parents' rights and obviously standing against some of the sexualization of children and all the things that are going on. And because of that, they're trying to remove him and there's going to be a, um, a special election coming up for those that live in Temecula. Um, and so he's going to be sharing after service at 1130. So he's going to give everyone an update and just kind of ways that we can pray. Um, after the message, there will be maybe a 10, 15 minute break. If you want to get a snack, do uh, whatever you got to do. And then right here in the sanctuary, if you can stay for it, it'll be about 30 minutes long. He'll give an update. And if you guys are, you know, if you've been in Southern California long enough to remember, Orange County used to be very conservative. It's very liberal now. San Diego used to be very conservative. Very liberal now. I mean, and even our own area is conservative still, but you can see pushes going in that direction. It's like, how does that happen? Well, this is exactly how it happens, by trying to get people into more local positions with city governments, school boards, things like that, and try and oust people that have biblical values and conservative values. Unfortunately, a lot of times, the church and people are apathetic to the situation, I'm not saying that we need to be political activists, but we certainly need to be, if we're in those areas, be voting for those people that hold our values. And even if we're not in those areas, be praying and finding ways that we can come alongside. Because if we do nothing, then, you know, it's our own fault when that kind of stuff happens. So we don't want to see that happen. You know, he's a, a great defender of conservative values and truth and protecting children. And we don't want to see that happen. So anyway, he's going to share afterwards if you can stay for that. And then today is our all-church family softball game. So hopefully you guys can participate in that. It's going to be at 2 o'clock at Torrey Pines Park. So Torrey Pines Park, if you go down Marietta Hot Springs to Margarita, and if you're traveling east, then you would go south uh, on Margarita up to Torrey Pines. Then you would go east or left at that point, and it's right, just follow that all the way back, and there's a little park back there that we play softball at. You don't have to have softball skills. We're going to go out there and embarrass ourselves, all of us. So, and it's for men, women, children, everybody that wants to come. We have a bunch of gear for everybody. And it'll probably be a couple hours. And, and we had a really great time last year when we did it. So we want to encourage you guys after service, if you can make it, go change. Put on some sneakers if you don't already have them on. Eat some lunch and come over and just have a, a good time of fellowship and play some softball with us. Okay? All right, well, if you guys would go ahead and stand, we're going to pray. We're going to ask the Lord to bless today's service, and then we're going to worship the Lord. All right, Lord, we're so grateful and thankful for all that you've done. And if we're not, Lord, just flood our hearts and our minds with your goodness and the things that you've done in the past, you're doing in our lives now, and you want to do in the future. For if we're not grateful, then we're just not seeing clearly because you've done so much, Lord. So help us to have those eyes to see exactly who you are and what you're doing on our behalf. And we pray for this morning's service as we come together, the body of Christ, to fellowship, to worship in your name, to study your word. Would you bless the service? Would you bless just the gifts and talents that are up here on the stage that are going to be leading us? Bless Pastor Joe as he brings the word. Um, we just want to grow in our knowledge and, and awe of you, and we want you to be glorified. And so we lift this morning's service up to you in the name of Jesus. Amen.
the Lord. You guys can go ahead and have a seat for one sec. We're going to take communion together. So communion is that thing that, that ordinance that Jesus instituted at the Last Supper, right? If you remember, he was having that Passover uh, meal with his disciples, and as he was breaking the bread and drinking from that cup, he said, do this in remembrance of me and what he had done. And so what we like to do here is uh, there's no set time to have communion, right? We like to do it on the third Sunday of each month, as we remember. And we like to kind of switch up the different aspects of communion. So there's a lot, of, a lot of different things that you could talk about with communion. And we like to kind of switch it up each month so you're getting a different aspect. And this morning, we just wanted to briefly just share what it means about the cup and the blood. So at that last uh, supper, at that Passover meal, Jesus was taking that cup. Now, if you guys had the privilege of being with us for the Seder, because Passover was actually last month, and we had the Seder here that we did with uh, the Jewish ministry, they told us that there were four cups. Traditionally, there's four cups that were drank during this process. And it all goes back basically to Exodus, right? So God delivered the nation of Israel, from bondage uh, in Egypt. And the different aspects kind of relate to that deliverance from slavery or from bondage. Well, that third cup is known as the cup of redemption. And many scholars believe that it's that third cup that Jesus was sharing when he made that statement, that this is my blood in the new covenant. You know, do this in remembrance of me. And so you think about the significance of that. If that third cup, that cup of redemption, is what we're remembering, then we're remembering the fact that it's Christ's blood that redeems us. Now that word redemption means to be bought back, to be bought back from slavery. So in the context of Israel, 
and Exodus, God was bringing them out of bondage in Egypt and redeeming them. Well, for us, that redemption is from what? Sin. Yeah. Slavery to sin. So every person is born a slave of sin. And this was always the ultimate plan, that God would come and deliver people from the bondage of sin, that we no longer have to be bound not only by the the penalty, which is death, separation from God, but even just the power of sin in a person's life. I mean, aren't you just sick of the power of sin in our lives? And that day will come when we will be completely free from that, known as glorification. But in the meantime, as we take communion... We remember those things. So the body, the cracker, represents his body that was broken for us in our place. We should have been broken, but he was broken for us. And then the, the juice or the wine is representative of his blood, the new covenant that we are redeemed by his blood. So let's go ahead and take this together. If you want to take out the cracker, and we will pray and take it together, and then we'll pray over the cup, and we'll take that together as well. And if you don't have one, uh, could you raise your hand if you came in and didn't get one of these? We have ushers in the back that can hand them out right now. Okay, everybody's got one, good. All right, so let's take the, the wafer and the bread. And Lord, we just thank you that you made this sacrifice, that you paid this price, that you allowed your body to be broken in our place that we wouldn't have to be broken. And we're so grateful, and we remember that, and we don't want to take that lightly, Lord. We pray that you would just help us to see it in all of its glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And let's partake. And then if you can open up the cup, it's a little tricky. Don't fling it on yourself. one second. And Lord, we do recognize that this cup represents your blood that was given for us, that was shed on our behalf, Lord, that we might be redeemed out of the bondage to sin and death. And we're so grateful for that, that we don't have to sacrifice animals, that there is no temporary covering anymore, but there is a permanent, a once and for all price that was paid for that sin. And as we drink this cup, Lord, we remember that it represents your blood that was shed for us for the remission of sins. And so we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. And if you guys could pass your communion cups to the aisles right here. We got, oh, we do have someone in the middle, so you could pass them here as well. And we'll collect those. And then after that, if you guys want to go ahead and just stand back up. We are going to worship the Lord with a few more songs.
my sin Six one through three, in the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called out to one another and said, "Holy, holy, holy, is Yahweh of hosts." The whole earth is full of his glory. Everything and 
come before you this morning and worship in the word to glorify your son Jesus, to have that expectant heart and mind knowing that you are going to touch each and every one of us, Lord, that you're going to meet our needs, Lord, and that you have put us on this path of righteousness and transformation and holiness, Lord, for a reason, that we might display to the world, Lord, who you are, what you're like, Lord Jesus, because we know that sometimes people will not open the Bible, but they will read your life. And we ask that that would take place today, Lord, that our fellowship would be in the Spirit, that you would awaken our hearts and minds, that you would revive us from the dust, Lord, that you would give us that direction and wisdom to lead our families, our lives, Lord, to, to be a witness for you in a dark place. So, Father, today we ask that you would give us understanding in your word and a sweet fellowship of your spirit. Lord, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning to you. It's good to always fellowship and be in worship in the word with the saints. Uh, junior high and high school can be dismissed to their studies. And we have a packed day today, as Pastor Chad was, was listing out for us all these different things that we can partake in today. But today, first of all, we're going to give priority to the Word of God. So let's turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter... That's good. I like that. I even got it out of my mouth and you're already clapping. That's wonderful. It's going to be a good day today. Let's turn in our Bibles to Mark chapter 13. We'll be in verses 1 through 13. Now, if you've been with us in our study through the gospel, we have seen Jesus work all kinds of great and glorious miracles, bringing restoration to the people, bringing truth through his discourses and studies. And most recently in chapter 11 and 12, Jesus so thoroughly answered his detractors, who were the religious leaders at the time in Jerusalem, that they no longer tried to trap him in his words or to discredit him before the people because his answers were so thorough that it actually discredited the religious leaders and put them on the defensive. They said, this isn't working. We're going to have to turn to something else. Unfortunately, it would be a plot to murder Jesus at the cross. Now, 
at this point, Jesus is in the temple. This is the midway through the week of the Passion Week. He only has about two more days before he goes to the cross. He is spending these last moments before the cross with his disciples. His public ministry is completely over at this point. He is now involved in a private ministry with his disciples and behind the scenes to prepare them for what is coming ahead, the years ahead, the decades ahead, and by extension, what is going to happen to the church ultimately ahead and as well as, as Israel. Now we come to what we call the Olivet Discourse. This is perhaps the most important discourse and the longest speech or answering of questions to the disciples that we have in the New Testament. It is very important as attested to all three synoptic gospels containing this Olivet Discourse. The Gospel of John does not contain it. It had already been written three times, and John, by the time he wrote his gospel, didn't see the need to rehash the Olivet Discourse. But it's so very important. All the Gospels contain it, but we need to keep in mind that each one of the three Gospels contains something fresh and unique to add to the discourse. And so many people have got tripped up when we come to Matthew 24 or Mark 13 or Luke 21 where this is presented because they don't realize that there are different time periods that overlap what Jesus is saying to the disciples. It has the time from the Roman destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. It has the time of after that destruction and into the church age. And then it has the time of the tribulation period. And then Matthew even extends it beyond the time of the tribulation period and into the judgment of the nations in Matthew 25. So you would have to, as a student of the word, bring those time frames together to form a proper chronology to understand it. Secondly, it's important to realize that the Olivet Discourse does not address the church per se. It is decidedly Jewish. It is given to Israel. And though it describes the time period that the church age would be involved in, it is certainly speaking of, of course, Daniel's uh, 70th week. It's the abomination of desolation he brings forth in Matthew chapter 13. It talks about uh, their beatings and synagogues and so forth. So Jesus is trying to prepare the disciples of what's coming next after his crucifixion. Because the disciples in their mind, they could look to the Old Testament prophets and see that there was no line of demarcation between the Messiah's death and ultimately the establishment of the kingdom of God. So in the disciples' mind, they believed that there would be no extended period, period of time after his death, and that that would ultimately usher in this kingdom of God. You know, what was the question out of their mouth? When is your kingdom coming? Is now the time for the kingdom and so forth? Well, the Olivet Discourse brings it all out into the open. He receives these three questions from his disciples, and they are three key questions that deal with the timing of the kingdom and also discerning the signs prior to the kingdom so they can know when the kingdom is about ready to come. But a third issue that runs through the Olivet Discourse is that they are encouraged by Jesus in his reply to be steadfast in their duty to spread the gospel, to continue to give that missionary movement, to plant those churches, to go from place to place sharing the wonderful gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the gist of what he's trying to bring. We're going to deal with the first half of the chapter, which only will answer perhaps two of the questions that the disciple ask, and then uh, some of the second question and third question will be answered ultimately next week. So notice in verse 1, he says, Then as he went out of the temple, his disciples said to him, Teacher, see what manner these stones and what buildings are here. So ultimately, the disciples, 
couldn't help but to notice the beautiful temple that was in place. Uh, Jesus certainly did not say, no, these, this, this, these buildings are garbage. No, they need a remodel. Well, he didn't say that because they were extraordinarily beautiful. Back in 20 BC, you had Herod the Great start this ambitious rebuilding, remodeling project of the existing temple. He expanded the platform base on which the temple stood. He remodeled the buildings themselves and brought all this white polished marble in. He overlaid the top of the temple with gold and it became quite a spectacle. I mean, the stones that he used were some 25 feet long, 12 feet uh, wide and about 18 feet high. Um, these were stones as big as a bus that formed the foundation to the new expanded retaining wall. They were glorious buildings. In fact, it was these buildings that would ultimately be destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD, and Jesus is about to make a prediction about that. But during John chapter 2 and verse 20, we are told that it was 46 years that the Herod dynasty had been remodeling this temple at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. So we're coming close to 50 years of remodeling where this place glistened. It was actually an architectural wonder of the Roman world. It was the largest religious structure that we know of the, on the entire planet at that time. And the disciples are glorying in this wonderful, magnificent, glistening uh, building called ultimately the temple. Now, this would ultimately come to an end. These buildings would be affected. They'd be destroyed. Notice verse 2, Jesus makes his prediction. And Jesus answered and said to him, do you see these great buildings? Not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. So ultimately, Jesus makes the prediction of the Romans under General Titus Vespasian, where he would come in 70 AD and destroy this temple. He would dismantle the buildings. He would uh, take every block that was up on Temple Mount and shove them over the sides of the retaining walls to the streets below because there was all this gold that got melted when they burned down the temple, and they were certainly going to confiscate all that gold, but to do so would mean you'd have to dismantle every building and pry it out of the cracks and out of the ground and so forth. And even today, if you've been to Israel, you've seen those pile of stones at the base of the retaining wall, the southwestern uh, corner of the Temple Mount complex. They're still left there for you uh, to see today. And this will be a fulfillment of Matthew 23, where Jesus says the house of Israel will be left desolate. It will be a punishment and a judgment upon Israel for rejecting their Messiah, for the religious leaders being corrupt, to try to discredit and kill the Son of God. Unfortunately, the Jewish nation would pay a heavy price for that, that would ultimately last almost 2,000 years, and we just saw that period of time kind of come to an end in 1948 when they got their nation back. They still don't have their temple back. That's coming yet in the future. But ultimately, thou, those buildings would be destroyed. And I find it ironic that after the Herodian dynasty remodeled these buildings, they finished under Herod Agrippa II in about 64 AD. That was only six years before they were totally destroyed by the Romans. Six years later, it would be completely dismantled, completely obliterated. And there is, when you go there today, there's no original buildings up there. They're all new buildings or buildings made during the Middle Ages and the early Middle Ages, the Dome of the Rock, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, and so forth. There is absolutely nothing original on the top of the Temple Mount. And so this prediction, he wanted the disciples to understand but then they ask these crucial questions in verses 3 and 4. I'm sure on their way out of the temple, as verse 1 says, they made their way up to the top of the Mount of Olives where they would have a perfect visual viewpoint looking over across the Kidron Valley and toward the beautiful glistening buildings of the temple. It would be a perfect place to answer their questions. Notice what he says in verse 3. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives... 
opposite the temple, and now you can just picture this, he's sitting on this mount. For us, it looks more like a hill because we think of mount much higher than that, but it wasn't. Um, they're looking across the Kidron Valley, across the Garden of Gethsemane that would be below, to the Temple Mount structure that would be separated by this Kidron Valley. It just looks like it's a stone throw away, and you can almost look down upon the Temple Mount complex. So it was the perfect position, hence the Olivet Discourse. Notice who was there. Two pairs of brothers, Peter, James, John, and Andrew. You know that Peter and Andrew were brothers, and, and then James and John were brothers, and they had these four disciples picking Jesus' brain a bit about the signs of when all these things shall be. Notice in verse 4, tell us, when will these things be? Now, when he asked that question, he's referring to the destruction that he just told them about of the actual temple. When will the things of the destruction of the temple be? When will they take place? And then there's a follow-up question. What will be the sign when all these things will be fulfilled? So Mark presents two clear questions to Jesus. However, Mark's second question here, what will be the sign when all these things be fulfilled, actually encompass two distinct questions. And those two questions are clearly highlighted in Matthew chapter 24, verse 3. Notice what Matthew says. He says, tell us, when will these things be? So it's the same as Mark's first question, referring to the destruction of the temple. And then notice he breaks out two more questions. And what will be the sign of your coming and the sign of the end of the age? So ultimately, the disciples were unclear about the timing of the kingdom of God, the timing of Christ's return, the timing of that third issue, the destruction of the temple. And this is what the Lord is going to clarify for them, the timing aspect, and to hopefully make clear the signs that they can look forward to in discerning when these very important times will come. You see, like I said before, these Disciples didn't see an extended period of time coming, uh, especially after the destruction of the temple. They thought, oh, this is going to be the moment where Jesus comes back. We're going to set up that kingdom. We're going to rule and reign. We'll be ruling and have victory over our enemies and so forth. They had that somewhat of a misinterpretation and an expectation that didn't uh, correspond with what Jesus taught. So in verses 5 through 13 you're going to see Jesus offer a preparation of sorts to the disciples to answer the second and the third questions. Namely, what will be the sign of your coming? And what will be the sign of the end of the age? He won't get to the destruction of the temple till a little bit further down the line. So Jesus is going to give the disciples some general characteristics of what to expect following his death. And then we'll see these characteristics play themselves out ultimately uh, in the book of Acts and throughout the church age of which we're still seeing them play out today. That's called the time of the Gentiles, which we live in ultimately today. So to be clear, Matthew, Mark, and Luke do not address, at least in my opinion, the first half of the tribulation in these verses that follow. These are issues and characteristics that will characterize the church age, that will characterize spreading the gospel, and these characteristics will come alongside at the same time we're endeavoring to fulfill our missionary endeavors of Matthew 28, go therefore into all the world and preach the gospel, making disciples. But these things will intensify the closer it gets to the start of that first half of the tribulation period, which you can read about in Revelation chapter 6 with the sealed judgments. So he's, notice what he says in Matthew 24, verse 14. He says that the period will end or conclude when the gospel has been given basically to the inhabited world. He says in Matthew, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all of the world as a witness to all nations 
and then the end shall come. We also read in Mark's account, he says that the end is not yet. He also says that preaching the gospel, then the end will be future. He also says that this is merely the beginning of sorrows. So for those reasons, I don't believe the first half of the tribulation is mentioned here. This is the characteristics that we will see for the next 2,000 years from Jesus' death to basically our time today until they intensify to the point to begin the tribulation of Revelation chapter 6. So notice what he goes on to say here. The disciples didn't discern that extended time period. And now Jesus is going to describe these characteristics of the church age, what would follow, and then ultimately lead up to the tribulation period over time. He says in verses 5 through 7, And Jesus, answering them, those questions they just asked, began to say, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and will deceive many. But when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be troubled, for such things must happen, but the end is not yet. you got to underline that. It is not yet. He is speaking of the general characteristics that will characterize the church age, and also immediately after his death, they will get started in this sense. First of all, he says to take heed. That's an imperative. That's a biblical command in the Greek text. He didn't say, well, if you want to watch out. He says, watch out, take heed, beware. In other words, you are ultimately responsible for being aware of what's around you in sense of deception. Notice what this age will be characterized by. Deception. Take heed that no one deceives you. And the best way to take heed that no one deceives you is to have your eyes open, your discernment up, and being biblically literate. You see, that's why we put a focus on the teaching of God's Word, is because unless you're biblically literate, you have only your own opinions to draw from. You only have your own understandings, your own experiences, your own feelings and emotions. All those things change and are subjective. The only thing that's subjective is the Word of God. That's the number one thing that will prevent deception from overtaking your life and your heart and your mind. Notice, secondly, in verse 6, he says, for. Now that for means it's explanatory. He's giving you the reason for why you should be alert. For many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and will deceive many. So ultimately, you will have people claiming to be the Christ. Now, Jesus was the first one who claimed to be the Christ, and he indeed was. He was genuine. But soon after, there will be different imposters that would creep up. You had Bar Kokhba in the second century. You had Judas the Galilean creep up. You had uh, different people throughout the history of the church saying, I'm the Messiah. You had David Koresh in Waco, Texas. And more in the modern age, you had all these different people. Even the Jews thought that Rabbi Schneerson, just in uh, the 20th century, might have been the Messiah, that he was he. Now, Schneerson never claimed he was the Messiah, but his followers thought that he was going to proclaim it, and they believed that he was the Messiah, ultimately. So this deception of who the Christ is will be something that characterizes the church age. The explosion of the cults and the spiritual leaders. We have all kinds of cults and new religious movements now today, and they can be very dangerous. I mean, you are, it's fresh enough in our minds to remember the suicide in Rancho Santa Fe, uh, the um, Heaven's Gate cult. You know, they wanted to hitch a ride to that Hale-Bopp comet, you know, and and that's what they were teaching, that this is our way. This is a one in a chance lifetime. We have to, our spirit has to attach ourselves to that in order to go to heaven, so to speak. And these are educated people who did this. These are computer programmers. These are people who, who knew um, how the world works and they went to school and so forth. Nobody is beyond being deceived. 
But he goes on in verse 7, but when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be troubled. Now, this is important to remember. He doesn't want you as a believer. He's speaking to the disciples, of course, but we can take by this by extension. He doesn't want us to be sidetracked from our mission of preaching the gospel. When you hear of wars from, it's talking about from distant lands. It's talking about hearing the battle sounds, if you will. And we hear about Russia invading Ukraine. We hear about Iran being a proxy to a lot of these terror groups. We, we hear about things that are happening. We hear about Israel maybe might, after they finish Gaza, you know, go in to take care of Hezbollah. We, we have all this. This should not paralyze us. This should not make us stop and think, oh, the Lord is going to come back right now and we need to just sit at home and then sell everything and then go live in the mountains or something like that. He wants you to continue spreading the gospel, to being a light in your culture. He wants to, you to keep going forward, not to get sidetracked with these various distractions. Yes, wars and rumors of wars have characterized the time of the Gentiles, which we are still in now. Even Daniel says, the remainder of time uh, after the Messiah would be cut off would be with a flood and to the end, desolations. In other words, there would be wars and talks of war and plottings and intrigues, but this should not dissuade you. It says, do not be troubled. You know, it troubles a lot of us to the point where we can't move anymore. It paralyzes our mind. It paralyzes our study of the word of God. Well, I'm going to be going to heaven tomorrow. I don't need to keep reading the Bible. Well, that's going to be further from the truth. Keep reading. Do not be troubled. For such things, notice, must happen. This word must, day in the Greek text. It means a divine necessity. It means God's sovereign plan has to play itself out. And it plays itself out often through people experiencing the consequences of their sin. It plays out through nations going to war with each other. All these things must take place for God to make sure the consequences of sin are meted out and also that their, his plan is meted out. Because remember, guys, where there is no adversity or where there is no trouble, there also is no ministry. Amen. Amen. There is no need for the gospel, so to speak. You see, when people have such a cozy and cush life, they never see their own spiritual need. And God allows these things sometimes to paint that dark backdrop for you to go forward and give the gospel, that brilliant, bright light of hope and life and transformation in the power of Christ and through his spirit. But I love what he follows up with at the end of verse 7. He says, but the end is not yet. Literally, it's the end is still to come. He doesn't want them to stop, to continue going forward, but he wants them to expect these various distractions. So what is he saying here just in verses 5 and through 7? He's saying what the end is not. Okay, that's what this last phrase means. I'm going to describe to you these characteristics that refer to what the end isn't and what the end is not here. The end, it says, is not yet. So he speaks and answers their question initially from a negative perspective. It's not when these things happen. It's not when this happens. It's going to be something yet extended in the future. And so in verse 8, notice that Jesus addressed the disciples' question from the negative perspective, that is, by those things that would not indicate the end had begun, but now answers the disciples' third question, what will be the sign of the end of the age? In other words, what will be the sign of the beginning of the end of the age? We say uh, beginning because the end of verse 8 tells us. So what are the signs of the beginning of the end of the age? Well, for nation will rise up against nation. Those are talking about world wars. When nations have conflict and many nations get together, it could be one nation with one nation, or it could be multiple nations as we saw in World War I or World War II. 
This is what he's talking about. The kingdom against kingdom. Those are speaking about regional wars, regional conflicts. And this is what the time of the Gentiles would be characterized by, is by warfare. And there will be, notice these various things, earthquakes in various places, and there will be famines and troubles. If you look to Luke's gospel, Luke 21, he says there will be great earthquakes. And boy, we have seen some doozies thus far. But when you go to the book of Revelation, in Revelation 11, it says that 7,000 people will be killed in a great earthquake in Jerusalem. In fact, when you get to Revelation 16, it says the greatest earthquake that will ever take place in the history of our planet will be so severe, it will divide Jerusalem into three parts because of the cracks and the different geograph geographical upheavals that will ultimately come. The face of the earth will be severely changed, topographically speaking. It will be a time like none other time in the history of the world. Now, the quakes it's talking about here are these quakes that will intensify in severity. And it does appear like we're having more earthquakes. It's not just better ways to detect the earthquakes, as some would suggest. I believe that there is proof out there that says there are more earthquakes and they're becoming more frequent and even uh, more severe. But the second thing he says, there will be famines. Now, famines can be devastating. I mean, we even have famines as we speak here now. But in Revelation chapter 6, a fourth of the world, the population of the earth, will be wiped out due to warfare and famine. I mean, that's a huge part of an 8 billion plus global planet. Famines can be devastating. And then troubles, global events, you know, all these things will signal, notice how he finishes, the beginning of things. These are the beginnings of sorrows. Now, in our English text, it has the definite article before beginnings. These are the beginnings, which seems to imply that these are the one sign. This is the specific issue. But in the Greek text, there is no definite article. It literally can be translated, these are a beginnings, or a beginnings, or just beginnings of sorrows. So what he's saying here is that the end is not yet, again, like he said previously to us. This is just the start of things when they start ramping up, and they will intensify. Because this word sorrows here literally means birth pains. And what happens with birth pains the closer to birth you give? It gets more severe, more close together contractions, and the pain becomes more sharp, the suffering becomes more sharp, right? Until there is the birth. And that's what he's saying here, that this is simply the beginning of those contractions that will lead to the birth of the new messianic kingdom. As you go through, obviously, the, the seven-year period called the tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble, Jeremiah says, uh, the time of Daniel's 70th week, ultimately. And then at the end of that 70th week, at the end of the seven-year tribulation, the new kingdom will come with Jesus' return to the earth. That's when the birth of the new messianic age will ultimately be there. So let's not take from this necessarily that we're talking about the tribulation time at that point, even though there will be these characteristics there, but in a much more hyper way, much more severe, much more uh, close together. And just think, seven-year period is a close period to fall out with all these things happening kind of all at once. It's going to be quite a time never before experienced and will never be experienced before in the years ahead. Now, keep in mind as we read verse 8 that each generation will have wars. Each generation will have famines. Each generation will have earthquakes and troubles and, and all these things. And that this is something that must ultimately take place. Again, that divine necessity. God's sovereign hand is bringing about his kingdom, but he's doing it through a process of an extended period of time that culminates in the seven-year tribulation period. Now, this is the reason why I do not take the first half of Mark 13. 
or even uh, Matthew 24 up to verse 14 and Luke 21, the first half, as the first half of the tribulation. These are things that are going to be experienced as we are even today with more intensity as we get closer to the birth of the messianic kingdom. So notice verses 9 through 13 now. Now Jesus introduces a bit of a parenthesis here to describe the opposition that the disciples will end up going through. And this opposition we can take by way of application uh, to our lives even today because it's still technically going on today. Notice uh, verse 9. But watch out for yourselves. Have you heard that before? Take heed. See to it. Beware. He constantly saying to be alert. These commands are very important because there's so much deception. Watch out for yourselves. It's a warning to be vigilant about your relationship to Christ. Not the time to be careless and cavalier about your your Bible study, your prayer, your devotion to the Lord, your yielding to the Spirit of God in your life. For they will deliver you up to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues. Usually the synagogues is where oftentimes the councils met. The judgments met in those synagogues, and you would get 39 lashes if you were deemed to be a heretic or somebody contrary to the law of Moses. And certainly the early Christians like Paul and the disciples would fall into that category. They would be people who would be persecuted, and we can just look through the book of Acts. You can see Acts chapter 4, you saw what happened to Peter and John when they went to the temple to preach Jesus. Uh, They were taken into custody, they were brought before the council, and what did they do? They got beaten and they were told not to be preaching Jesus any longer. And of course, they continued uh, to preach Jesus. And then you had Paul um, before Nero and before Agrippa. You see throughout the book of Acts, as they were hauled before magistrates and, and so forth. Or Acts chapter 7, Stephen was the first martyr of the church that we know of. Uh, he was stoned ultimately to death. And then he goes on to say, you will be brought before rulers and kings for my namesake for a testimony to them. And certainly we see Paul doing this a lot in the book of Acts. But throughout the church history, we have had this over and over and over again. Just read the Fox's Book of Martyrs. You'll see how many Christians gave their lives after they went before magistrates because they wanted to kill the Christians. Um, The Bishop of Smyrna, Polycarp, a disciple of John, you can read about his particular martyrdom. But notice it says for a testimony to them, that that was an opportunity to get the head of government the gospel message, number one. But number two, the word martyr, marturion in the the Greek text, means witness. It means testimony. And God will use the Christian believer's death in a martyrdom situation as a message to the people who see it. They can see the grace, they can see the comfort, they can see the the courage that the Spirit of God gives these people, and they will be moved by it. And so God's hand, again, these things must take place. And in verse 10, and the gospel must first be preached to all nations. We see this word must again. That's that word day again. Day is a divine necessity. It must take place. The gospel preaching will characterize the time from Jesus' death all the way up through the end of the age. We are still doing this even today. In fact, you go to Matthew's account, it says the gospel must be preached to all nations and then the end will come. Okay? And that's important to realize because we already read, not yet, it's only the beginning of sorrows or birth pangs that will intensify to get more. And then in Matthew 24, it says that the preaching of the gospel will characterize this age from Jesus' death, and then the end will be pushed out yet to the future after that is done. And we see that if we don't succeed in getting the gospel out to the whole world, we know that God has heavenly helpers to do that as well. 
We see in the book of Revelation that the angel from heaven was preaching through the sky the everlasting gospel. We see in Revelation chapter 7, there's 144,000 that were sealed by the Lord to continue to be a witness to, to the Lord Jesus Christ. These you know, 144,000 male um, Jewish believers, 12,000 from every tribe. And no, they're not the Jehovah's Witnesses. Okay? <laughs> No, I'm sorry, they weren't. See, in the early days, the Jehovah's Witnesses said, oh, we only have about a, maybe 100,000 people. We can claim to be the 144. But today, there is much more Jehovah's Witnesses out there than 144,000. So what do they do with those extra Jehovah's Witnesses? They say, well, you're going to be part of the other sheep. You're going to be part of the other sheep on earth. You're not going to be part of the 144. Those places have already been reserved for the first 144,000 Jehovah's Witnesses and so forth. But it clearly states these will be Jewish 12,000 from each tribe during the tribulation time, uh, not before. So ultimately, he says, these are the beginning of sorrows. The end is not yet. We must continue to preach the gospel and the missionary activity, the church activity must move forward. And all this must be the responsibility of every generation. Uh, their proclamation will be accompanied by what? Betrayal, persecution, troubled times, social upheaval, famines and troubles. But we are to continue moving forward to give the gospel. And then in verse 11, but when they arrest you and deliver you up, do not worry beforehand or premeditate that you will, what you will speak. But whatever is given you in that hour, speak that. So in other words, he's saying, guys, have the peace of the Lord with you. When you're hauled away and brought immediately before these magistrates because you've been preaching the gospel, don't worry about preparing and rehearsing what you're going to say. The Spirit is going to speak through you at that time. Allow God to speak through you. And that is the same today. Don't feel that you are under-equipped when it comes to those crisis moments. Maybe you're thrown into a counseling moment and you're just, what am I going to say? Let the Lord through his spirit speak through you. That comfort, that edification, the wise counsel, let the word of knowledge or the word of wisdom come through as a gift to you. Now, what is he not talking about here? He's not talking about not preparing to teach, Okay. He's not talking about under regular circumstances when you have the duty to teach or preach or to get ready. It doesn't say, oh, just don't even study. Just, you know, go out there and let the Lord just kind of will for that. I know what that looks like, okay? And nobody is ever happy with it, okay? Even with me, okay? But it ends up turning into a storytelling session, ultimately, and sharing from, you know, their life and their background, which can be useful, which is fine, but ultimately it's like, where's the beef? Where's the word of God? And so don't take this as something that, oh, the Lord is just going to do this. Remember, the Holy Spirit will bring out what he's put into you. He will bring out all those wonderful gifts and qualities, but he also uses your preparation. And thank God for that, because I don't know about you, but I am not smart enough to not prepare. I am not... Uh, one of those who can simply just roll out of bed and I've got all this knowledge just rolling out of my head that's farthest from the truth. You have to prepare. So you guys who are leading studies, you guys who are you know, leading others into the word, you know, really dive in, prepare. God will go as deep as you want to go. He will never leave you hanging. If people are going to be about you know, you know, surface to a certain extent, he'll meet you there. If you want to go deeper than that, he'll meet you there too. You can't exhaust an inexhaustible God, and he will be there for you. And the same is true when you run into this time of tribulation, that hour where you need a word and you don't know what to say. So what a blessing the Spirit is. Because he says, why does this happen, and why don't you have to premeditate so much in those situations? It's for that it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. That empowerment will work through his disciples, his apostles, 
and through ultimately today, his church. Now, this doesn't mean you're going to be acquitted of all charges. <laughs> this doesn't mean that you're going to be released from suffering consequences of your gospel. It doesn't mean that people are not going to die or be burnt at the stake or be stoned to death. But again, that is the testimony that that martyrdom will bring. It's never for a loss. God always has purposes. And in verse 12, now brother will betray brother to death. That's sad, isn't it? And the father, his child, and the children will rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. Now, this is a mouthful that family members will turn upon family members, children and parents against one another. In fact, we're kind of seeing that today in many respects. And as the government begins to enact policies that encourage, you know, telling on family members whether they're not wearing a mask or whether, you know, they've become LGBTQ or whether their gender pronouns are not being affirmed in the home, or whether they go to school and all these things are taking place, or whether you're counseling somebody who has questions about the gay lifestyle, you are forbidden to you know, give them counsel to talk them out of that through scripture. You know, all these kind of things. You can see it all coming together in policy creation at this point. And that's why I'm so interested in hearing our, our, our next speaker, is because all these things are at... Uh, the four, betrayal from those closest to you. He's telling the disciples to probably expect it, ultimately. Was Jesus betrayed by somebody close to him? Yeah, by one that he has to join the fold, Judas. Of course he was. And notice in verse 13, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. Now, some have taken this that, hey, this is teaching works righteousness. You have to endure to the end to be saved, and it's not. It's talking about those who are saved who endure patiently, that's what that word is, endure patiently without apostatizing. Those will be people that reflect their salvation. You will know that these people are saved because of their patient endurance without the apostasy and the falling away from the truth of Christ's word at this point. So you have this wonderful encouragement to the disciples, not so much because of the adversity that they're going to be, but what to expect. When Jesus tells you what to expect, and then you run into those, it's much easier to deal with than you thinking, why is this happening to me? I don't know about you, but I am grateful for the Lord's word because, oh, that's what Jesus said would happen. And that's why these warnings to the disciples are so, so very rich. And though I had planned to give you Jesus's answer to the first question, when will these things be fulfilled, referring to the destruction of the temple, we will wait till next week when we come back to look at his response to the second question or to the first question. See, he doesn't answer them in order, per se. He'll go, you know, second question, then back to the first question, and then he'll return to the third question when uh, we get toward the end of the chapter. Amazing signs that will be visible and displayed uh, for everybody to take heed in and to know what's coming next. And what you're seeing now is basically playing itself out. It's the first half of Matthew and the first half of Mark. In the church age, the time of the Gentiles, so to speak. These wars, rumors of wars, famines, earthquakes, and so forth. And really, they're at a point now where we seem to not, you know, but they're going to intensify. And they're going to lead into that great time of Jacob's trouble, ultimately the seven-year tribulation period. So if you want to read about the first half of the tribulation, you read, start Revelation chapter 6. You know, and it'll start you with that first half. Okay. All right, let's all stand together and let's take from this a warning for us too, a warning to persevere, to be patient, and remember um, 
God will give you that strength and the spirit to, to weather the storm. You see, his people are as strong as God is because the spirit lives in you. And that's what's so awesome about what we have in Christ. It's not just you out there fighting the battle, is it? The Lord is helping you. Christ lives in us, the Bible says. The Holy Spirit lives in you. The angels are sent, according to Hebrews, that they are ministering spirits sent to those who would inherit salvation. That's you and me. You're being helped, even though you don't maybe see it or notice it all the time. So with that, you know we have a busy day today. At 11.30, we're going to start the Dr. Joseph Komorowski's uh, message to us about being the president of the school board and the update and what's happening and how we can better pray for him and so forth. If you have grandkids or kids or are interested in, in wanting the moral change to come to the public school system, then please join us. We'd love for you to join us. And ultimately, we have our uh, softball game at Torrey Pines Park right off Margarita Road. We'd love to have all of you out there. Last year, we had a tremendous turnout. We were playing softball. It was so fun. I found out Chad can hit line drives. <laughs> you don't have to be a professional softball player. Just come on out, and uh, we've got equipment for you. And if you could, during the break right now, we're going to take about a 15-minute break, if you could sign up if you're going to play softball. There's a little sign-up sheet at the Connect desk. Sign up so we can divide uh, the teams more easily and so forth, if you remember. Okay? All right, let's pray. Lord, we thank you, Father, for your goodness, and we ask that you would be with us today as we fellowship with each other and think about these words that you have given the disciples in the Olivet Discourse, Lord, these powerful words of Jesus knowing the future and what to expect and to prepare us for the signs of the times ahead, Lord. Father, thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for reestablishing Israel and for giving us your strength as we move through this church age the best we can in our missionary activity, the preaching of the gospel, bringing people to you, Jesus. So let us be encouraged in that endeavor and continue with strength in your spirit. Lord, we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.
All right, please hang out, chit chat with each other, and fellowship. God bless you today. I'm alive when you breathe on me. Awake, awake, awake my soul. God resurrect these bones from death to life for you alone. that again. Breathe on me. Breathe on me, breath of God. Breathe on me. Breathe on me, breath of God. Breathe on me. Come alive. I come alive. I'm alive when you breathe on me. before your presence with singing. We come before your presence, Lord, expecting to meet with you. We just say that we need you so badly, Lord. We come to you for help, for life, for hope.